the great the great film of Cecil B. DeMille was The Ten Commandments. His, he had actually, had, oddly enough, had made it before as a silent film. But now this was Charlton Heston, Yul Brynner, and Baxter, huge, huge casts of literally thousands. The Exodus scene was one of the great scenes in which there was so much movement of people and animals and stuff that literally calves were born in the Exodus, you know, and camels had babies and stuff. And the, one of the great famous stories of DeMille is he did this from many different cameras. And they had literally thousands of people making, it took them weeks to set it up and days to shoot this, but one entire day for the actual exodus towards the promised land out of Egypt. Thousands of people, camels, everybody, right? And they shot it with maybe five different cameras from different close angles, far angles, way up in a hill angle, right and left, any, every which way and the noise they recorded, it was great. Anyway, the story is that on the take, oh, finally everyone goes, everything was working fine, and it worked, and it was a probably, it's, every, every uh, camera, at least the minimum they would carry are 10 minutes. Some they could even double load and make 20 minutes out of it. It was over, finished, cut, cut, cut. How was it for you, Harry? You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this, Mr. DeMille. My motor broke. I can't, I don't know if we got anything. I don't know. Oh, that's okay, Harry. We've got other cameras. And each guy had something. There was a glint. I'm telling you, we couldn't find out what the glint was, but it wrecked. It came in the camera. I don't know, CB. Well, we got, must have something. Probably the most dramatic shot is with the microphone and the megaphone now. George, how was it for you up there in the mountain? Whenever you're ready, CB, whenever you're ready, roll it. <laughs> Who knows if it's true, but it's a good story. As an actor in Hollywood, I had been a contract player at Paramount, which means I get a weekly salary and hopefully access to making films. It didn't always work that way. The first dubbing I did was on The Greatest Show on Earth, which was the circus picture that DeMille did. And uh, we did the dubbing of that, all the actors. We, we would be, uh, oh, my feet are killing me, or the train wreck, oh, oh my. One of my things was when uh, uh, Cornell Wilde had going to go in a, in a dive, trapeze artist had him cut the net, take the net away. And then what they did is they dug a pit and put the net on top of it, real soft net, and there's like a trampoline kind of. But that, it looked like he cut, cut the net to the floor, I mean to the ground of the circus tent. And he was way up on the top and he was gonna do this big thing, go through the fiery ring, catch the uh, catcher, whatever they call the guy, receiver, and then finish the act. And, and uh, in it, he was supposed to fall, miss the thing, go through the hoop, but miss the the catch and fall and break his back. Well, Cornell Wilde was gonna do that trick from up there. They, didn't, they had a long shot of him up there and then they had uh, Faye Alexander, a, a stuntman from uh, Muscle Beach in Santa Monica, made the actual trip through the circle and onto the ground. And it was perfect, it was just a magnificent. And my job, year, uh, six months later, when they put the sound in, was to go, hey, when Cornell Wilde went like that, my voice would go, hey, because I would do it in a microphone. And I tried to explain this to my parents in Chicago. They said, what are you talking about? Your voice is in here? Are you a ventriloquist? No, no, okay, forget it. Anyway, to tell, finish that story quickly is DeMille was pondering at the end, should he print it or not, because it was perfect. He said, did he go through the exact center? Oh, also when he landed, everyone was worried about him and he bounced up, he was okay. Was he right in the center of the hoop, do you think? I would like it more in the center. No, he was centered. My, and my shot was in the, they did it with multiple cameras. I had him in the center. I didn't see him in the center exactly. So let's do it one more time. And on that time, Faye Alexander broke his back. Sadly, but he lived, but he, he had a terrible fall. It didn't land just right. So when, was when I first met him, it was in, a, in that dubbing session, long after they were, uh, finished the film, 
of the circus film, Greatest Show on Earth. I met him, all the contract players were in there, and he sat there while Henry Wilcoxon, who was his right-hand man and always big in the movies in some you know, official capacity as far as the actor, because he was an old actor, he ran the dubbing, but DeMille was always there judging and stuff. And so I said, uh, I came down from Stanford, Mr. DeMille, I am very happy to be here. And I studied, uh, one class I took was in film history. And I've got a, in my book, I got a picture of you when you were an actor. Oh, I never was an actor, my boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, you were an actor. I mean, it was a, it was an, a film, early film, it's obviously a silent film. But uh, yeah, I, I've got that book. No, 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 I never was an actor. Yes, 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 you were an actor. No one doubts my memory, I'm sorry. And so we made a $5 bet. And I came in the next day with the book, showed him the picture of D.S. Porter, the early director in that film, and I gave him the five. I marked the book with the five, I just gave him the five. Anyway, he was a very pompous guy, but also very fair and very nice. In that day at the commissary, when after the premiere, which had taken place in Los Angeles, there had been one in New York, there had been one in Boston, there had been one here and there. But the L.A. premiere, the, it, they had a table at Paramount, and if there's a wicker chair that he sat in, in the commissary, I mean, right, in the commissary, where we eat. And uh, actors and writers and, you know, the real workers are eating out of a lunchbox, probably, with the, you know, the hoi polloi, we were in there. And if the wicker chair was there, it meant that DeMille was going to come to lunch. If the wicker chair wasn't there, then you could sit at that table. Wicker chair was there. We sat there, all of us together. And as we came in, I mean, not, I wasn't at that table. That was with him and his big time guys, that close friends and, and co-workers. I came in and said, Peter, Peter, come here. Because he knew everyone that was in that audience. He knew, every, he knew the guest list. Come here, come here. What did you think of our film? Now, I was in a period of my life where I couldn't lie at that time. Now I can lie anytime I want. But then I was not going to lie ever again. And I said, what am I going to say? What am I going to say that's true to not lying but not offending this icon? And so I said, Mr. DeMille, it was overwhelming. He took his knife and he banged his glass. Listen, 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 all everybody. Listen to what Peter said. Just what Bishop Sheen said, or whatever the guy, whoever it was in New York. Just with overwhelming, right, Peter? Overwhelming. And, and my actor friends are at the next table knew, oh, you cop out. Chicken! <laughs> but you, you wouldn't want to offend him. He did a great deal for movies, you know. He was great and carried Paramount. <laughs> In the trailers, which is the coming attractions that we see the weeks and months before the film comes to your local theater, the way they did it with that is they had built some grandstands up from the floor, 20 or 30, 25 rows up, filled with extras, and occasionally the camera would pan along and they'd stop, and there'd be Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, two Paramount people. Hey, this is a great film. I think we ought to see this film. This is great. And then they'd go on and pan, and there'd be Charlton Heston. No, he wouldn't, because he was in the picture, but other people, Dorothy Lamour, maybe, things like that. Anyway, also, the contract players, we were there. If we were going to do any specific, ooh, or something like that, it wasn't necessarily, this was on film. He was filming this. And the extras, they're probably, maybe a hundred extras, and way at the top there were these two ladies talking, and DeMille spoke with the microphone all the time. It was a guy's job to have the microphone ready for him. And he was saying, and, it, and he, he saw them talking up there while he was talking, and he said, excuse me, ladies, yeah, yeah, you two, ladies, you two up there, right there, with the red, yeah. What are you talking about? You realize that the time it takes to interrupt me has cost some thousands of dollars. There's lots of people here, and there's the film, and the, the lights. What was so important? You had to talk. No, oh, no, no, I'm serious. What was so important? And these ladies were mortified. They were 50 and 60 year old ladies, and they were just, oh, why did we talk? Oh, no, nothing, nothing. Why don't you come down here and tell us what it is that you were, that was so important that you interrupted this scene? Come on down, let them down, let them down, help them down. I mean, this is unmerciful. The guy was just a killer on this. They finally got down there, and one was in tears, and the other one was a little more 
upset and angry at herself, but also at that being humiliated like this. So he said, so why don't you tell us what it is? Here, take the microphone. Why don't you tell us what it is that was so important that you had to interrupt this take and you talked while I was talking? And the one, <laughs> and, and the, the microphone went to the strong lady and she said, figuring her career was over as an extra, she'd never work at Paramount again. Certainly the mill is a powerful enough guy. So what the heck? I just wondered when the old bachelor was going to call lunch. And this place was silent. All of us were silent. And he took the mic back, and to his great credit, he said, lunch. And he called lunch. The great film of Cecil B. DeMille was The Ten Commandments. I was in the Navy when they shot back at Paramount. They, uh, they, came, they did all the extra work in Egypt first. I mean, not extra, I mean the exterior work in Egypt. And then they came back to Paramount, and I was uh, stationed at Miramar down in the San Diego area. When they came back to Hollywood, and uh, I knew that they were there, and I remember I had done this dubbing with him earlier and had done the stuff. I, in the Navy, I said, I gotta be in a DeMille film. I can get off. I was in an air, a squadron, it's the air intelligence officer. I could, get, I could get free for part of a day or a whole day, almost at will. We were, we were prior to going overseas, we were all getting prepared and stuff. So anyway, I got um, on the phone and I got to uh, uh, his uh, secretary, who was a wonderful lady, and I said, I'd like to talk to Mr. DeMille. And I said, what's it about, Peter? I said, I want to talk to him about being in the, one of the scenes that he's doing. Oh, I'm sure he'll let you in the scene. Come on, I'll put him on. So he came up, Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, sir, and defending our country. You know? And, and uh, he said, uh, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I, I think I had visited also before that in my uniform when they were finding the little Moses in the rushes, you know? And, and it was charming because Charlton Heston it can be very stiff and stuff, but it, he was very charming in this case. He said, oh, hi, Charlton Heston, like I'd forgotten his name, you know? It, the only other guy that has ever happened to him is Joe Namath. He introduces himself as if you might have forgotten his name, like you didn't know who he was. Anyway, uh, DeMille uh, was very gracious on the phone and said, I'd like to be in, uh, in your film if I can get a day off. I'm only down in San Diego, and uh, I, uh, I'd like to be in a film of yours before, um, and I don't know where I was going with this sentence, before I get out of the Navy, or before I get shipped out, or I don't know what it was, but I stopped after the word before, and he said, uh, before I die, Peter? No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant, you know, before you stop, uh, you know, film. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. He said, come on, now, wait a minute. Yes, yes, you have brown eyes. I remember. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, the, the Moses' mother was Nina Foch in that film. She has beautiful blue eyes. They snapped on. And this is now in 1954, uh, maybe, 53, 54, 54 probably. Contact lenses weren't so soft in those days, and she had to wear brown contact lenses. He was convinced everybody in the Mediterranean area had brown eyes. So, so come on up. So I came up, and it was the day that he uh, was shooting the scene where Moses is confronting the Pharaoh, Yul Brynner, and Ann Baxter, his, his, uh, the Pharaoh's beloved, but also she loved Moses. Moses was going to throw down his staff, and it turned into a serpent to show the power of the Lord. This is the scene that I was going to be in. Now, first of all, they, they gave me longer hair and braided it. I was to stand with those, you know, those bracelets around your muscles, which was easy for me because I don't have any. And, and um, I was going to stand behind Ann Baxter in the scene in which Moses enters and con has a conflict with the Pharaoh over maltreatment of the Jews or something, and he slams down his staff, this big long staff, and it turns into a python snake. Just before the scene was to start, DeMille said, okay, now clear the set. Everybody who's not in this scene, go. No photographers, no reporters, no sisters, no brothers, no agents, nothing. Go, out, out, out. We must preserve the magic of movies. So I said, all right, they all traipsed out. So here's the magic of movies. Ready? Action. Heston strides forward and slams down the staff, this long staff. And DeMille yells, freeze! And all of us froze.
because I was frozen anyway. I was standing by an Ann Baxter. And the guy ran in, the prop man ran in, picked up the staff, put down a snake. Okay. And then they did a cutaway to someone going, ooh, like this. It, it, that bridges the moment that the prop man ran in and out. Anyway, the magic of movies was maintained. He believed in it. You know, he was great. But that was a big deal in those days, is the magic of movies. How did they do that? How did he, th that was a real snake. How did he do that? That was, that was the, one of the, another one of the DeMille days.